Caitlin Dickerson is the staff writer for The Atlantic, and she has written this month's cover story, which provides an exhaustive account of the Trump administration's family separation policy known as zero tolerance. Caitlin has spent 18 months working on this story. She interviewed over 150 people and reviewed thousands of documents. It's a remarkable piece of journalism that's being celebrated in many places right now. And we're gonna be talking about some of the most eye-opening takeaways from this piece. Caitlin, thank you so much for doing this and for talking to us about this important subject and this important piece of journalism. Talk to us about the Trump administration's zero tolerance policy because it exploded a few years ago People paid a lot of attention to the inhumane treatment of families. And now it then it was sort of forgotten. So let's go back. Tell me about why this approach came to be and why it was established in the first place. Sure. So zero tolerance was a policy to prosecute people who crossed the border illegally, including those who did so to seek asylum and including parents traveling with children. And it resulted in the separation of thousands of kids being taken away from their parents. But the idea behind it, which was to separate families as a deterrent, as a way to discourage migration in general, um, it first came up under President Obama, actually, in 2014. And, and the broader kind of notions that give rise to this idea in the first place, those trace all the way back to 9-11 actually, when the George W. Bush administration created the Department of Homeland Security with the goal of course of preventing future terrorist attacks and started to look toward the Southern border and trying to really crack down on illegal border crossing. The idea was to introduce consequences for border crossers that would then, you know, the messaging would make its way back to Mexico at the time and now Central America to discourage people from crossing the border. And so, um, you know, again, jumping forward in time to zero tolerance and family separation, there was a two year long battle that I, I documented in my story to try to introduce this consequence. There were a lot of people who were opposed to it. And so, you know, the, the broad, um, and vast separation of kids from their families, it's ultimately approved in the form of the zero tolerance policy, which goes into place in, in the summer of 2018. You know, I remember when this story surfaced, Caitlin, there was a lot of discussion about, well, this isn't a new policy. This actually was something that was in practice during the Obama administration, during the administration of George W. Bush. That's not exactly true, is it? It's not true. That's one of the many lines that uh, Kirsten Nielsen, who was D DHS secretary during Zero Tolerance and others in the Trump administration repeated, and they really confused the public and confused Congress in some cases. So what they're referring to there is that the federal statute making illegal border crossing a crime, a misdemeanor the first time and a felony the second time around and beyond, that's been in place for a very long time, and that's true. Um, but for the most part, federal prosecutors and federal judges you know, tacitly agreed for decades prior to President Trump taking office that this is not a crime that we think is worth um, using a lot of resources in these very you know, strapped border courts along the southern border. And also, you know, most people crossing illegally were doing so to work, which was considered a very low level offense. And so the statute, though it did exist, was very rarely invoked until it started being used under President Trump, again, for this purpose of being able to separate kids from their parents. Stephen Miller was one of the main architects of this policy, wasn't he? And why was he so passionate about implementing it? So Stephen Miller, President Trump's chief immigration advisor, he did take up the cause of separating kids from their parents as a deterrent. As your viewers, I'm sure know, you know he perhaps cared about about sealing the southern border and preventing migration more than anything else on President Trump's agenda. 
but it wasn't his idea originally. And, and so I try to trace that back to a man named Tom Homan. He was the head of ICE under President Trump. He'd been in border enforcement since he was in his 20s. And he came up with this idea and proposed it to President Obama. Again, thinking that if we introduce as a country a consequence this powerfully harsh, that perhaps it would discourage people from trying to cross the border and limit those numbers. I guess the question is, did it? Was it a deterrent for illegal immigration across the border, separating parents from their children? Did word travel back to these communities in Mexico? And as you said, in Central America, where so many immigrants were coming from? No. And in fact, you may recall that uh, following zero tolerance, border crossings under President Trump reached record high levels. You know, after this unprecedented attempt to try to minimize them, you, you had the opposite impact. And there's a lot of evidence going back to the very beginning, you know, 9-11 and prevention by deterrence, that, that deterrence doesn't really impact immigration in a meaningful way when you compare it to these other long range trends that are much more important, you know, the economic factors in the United States and in the home countries people are leaving behind, public safety, and just general opportunities, those tend to impact immigration more than anything else. Um, very specifically, deterrence has been shown in some studies to impact at an, on an individual level. You know, Katie, if you're apprehended crossing the border illegally and you are prosecuted, your personal likelihood of crossing again may go down. But it, it's nowhere near on the level of impact as things like economics. And of course, it comes with these very serious consequences and, and downsides for people's lives. Let's talk about those. Let's talk about some of the tragic outcomes that we heard about at the time, Caitlin, but you uncovered even more in the course of your reporting. Family separation, you know, it's actually something that scientists use when they're researching medication to treat mental health, um, you know, and to treat mental illnesses. They, in, those studies are done with mice and they actually use maternal separation as kind of the gold standard for mimicking trauma. Um, so, you know, migrants crossing the border very often are, are fleeing very harrowing circumstances and it can be hard to differentiate and, and sort of rank one person's challenges to another. But by and large, um, experts even prior to zero tolerance being put into place said that separating children from their parents would, would cause harm that is, is on a level of its own. Um, even families that have been reunited are still struggling very seriously today. Kids with developmental delays, you know, bedwetting, you know, just insularity, not wanting to leave home, constantly living in fear that their parents might be taken away from them again. And parents are struggling too. And therapists have pointed out to me very often they're not dealing with their own mental health because they're so focused on trying to rebuild their relationships with their kids and help them get better. And, and of course, there we're talking about families that have been reunited, but you have hundreds that have not been reunited. And you have over 150 kids who to this day, four years later, their parents still haven't even been found. Can you explain what would happen to these children after they were taken from their parents? We heard about it at the time, about them being kept in these sort of makeshift structures, um, you know, sleeping on the ground. We heard recordings, I believe, from NPR of one child, um, just heartbreaking sounds of, of a child traumatized and, and in anguish. So what would happen to these kids? Those recordings were obtained by ProPublica and they were among the only record that we had of what happened to separated parents and children under them, other than their own testimony, you know, which it was almost never corroborated by government officials. But I interviewed for my story a Salvadoran consular worker who came forward, Nariz Gonzalez. She was based in a, a CBP processing facility, the Customs and Border Protection along the Southern border. And she watched these separations take place. So she said, you know, children and their parents would arrive on buses at this facility. They were um, ushered out of the buses and then border patrol agents would move in and, and begin to take the kids away from their parents, often not really explaining what was going on, maybe saying, you know, simply that they were under orders from President Trump to take kids away and nothing more than that. As you can imagine very quickly, these scenes escalated. They were very emotional and even 
you know, near violence. She said she watched as kids were literally being pulled, you know, on one arm by border patrol agents and on the other by their parents, you know, screaming and crying. She's still haunted by the the sounds just inside that facility of these children who were in such great pain. And from those facilities, you know, the parents were taken away to uh, facilities that are run by DOJ so that they could be prosecuted, as we discussed. And the kids were transferred into the custody of an entirely separate federal agency, the Health and Human Services Department. Because of the way that their shelters for children work and the placements that they do, the children were often sent to states very far away. For example, a lot of caseworkers who I interviewed who cared for separated children you know, for my story, they were based in Michigan. And so you'd have a parent who's prosecuted in Southern California, Arizona, Texas, and then you have their child being sent to, to New York or to Michigan, for example. And, and that is part of why parents and children became really lost to each other and to the relative federal agencies caring for them and why it took so long to get those families reunited after they were separated. What were some of the challenges? Obviously, they were many, many miles away, but did the system make it difficult to make these connections and to reunite these families? Well, almost no logistical planning took place prior to the implementation of zero tolerance and during the separations that took place, hundreds of them, even before then, during 2017. So that was one of the main findings of my investigation is that you know, even though you had experts within the bureaucracy and the federal government, you know, subject matter experts who got wind that this policy was being considered and debated and who were raising red flags and pointing out this very issue that we don't have a system for keeping track of where a parent is and where their child is when they're being detained by completely separate federal agencies, that we don't have a process for parents to apply or request to regain custody of their child after the parent had been prosecuted. You know, they warned that parents would be deported without their children, which happened in more than a thousand cases. But they warned of, this is a quote from a government record, potential future populations of U.S. orphans. And these warnings were disregarded by people like Stephen Miller, but also people within, you know, the the enforcement agencies, people who were in ostensibly apolitical roles, they felt so much pressure to move forward with this policy. They did so without preparing for it. One of the striking things about your reporting is there seemed to be a practice of not so benign neglect on the part of many government officials who really thought that someone else was minding the store, if you will. That's right. You know, I spoke to dozens of federal officials, again, in these apolitical roles, um, as well as some who were political appointees of President Trump, who said, you know, they very much opposed the idea to separate families, whether it was via prosecution or some other means. And yet when I would say, well, you know, tell me about meetings where this was discussed. What did you say? You know, where and how did you um, put forward your concerns? I was told repeatedly, you know, These weren't meetings where it would have been strategic for me to speak up. I couldn't do so in front of people like Stephen Miller. Um, And, you know, it it could put my career on the line. Or they would say, you know, often they would say these ideas were so outlandish and ridiculous. We didn't think that anyone would ever do them. You know, the problem is that people who are telling me these stories, they they were in very high ranking roles. It really, really was left to them to stop this from happening and they didn't. And I think that their role is as critical as those, if not more, um, as those of these more hawkish political appointees because it's in many ways not at all surprising, like we've discussed that someone like Stephen Miller would be pushing for these policies. Um, what it takes is someone who's a subject matter expert, who's not you know, motivated purely by you know, the goal to sort of get the president reelected, for example. People who know these systems know how they work. Um, it's really to them, and it was to them, to, to push back. And in this case, they didn't. They didn't. And they were sort of bystanders, and they sort of let it happen, including the head of the Department of Homeland Security, who was an important source for you, Kirsten Nielsen, at least mm-hmm. talked to you on the record. I met her uh, at one point and she seemed very uncomfortable about, this was right after she resigned, everything that had transpired during her tenure. 
What did she tell you about her unwillingness to step forward and to advocate against this policy? She told me that she faced immense pressure to approve of zero tolerance. You know, so right after she becomes Homeland Security Secretary, um, she's proposed, she, she receives this idea, it's proposed to her to separate families administratively. Um, she rejects that right away and says, no, I'm not going to do it. Um, but then this alternative sort of way of achieving the same end is proposed to her to prosecute parents, which would trigger a separation, but doing so under a different guise, if you will. You know, she's very skeptical and she's saying, you know, do we have systems in place to prevent all these negative outcomes we've been discussing from happening? Has this been done before? Um, she seems to have been actually directly misled with regard to that question. She and really all of her advisors said to me that they were under the impression that parents had been prosecuted in substantial numbers in the past, that it had occurred smoothly and without issue under prior administrations. You know, a lot of people were misled. And you asked me about that earlier in our conversation because, because so many people were confused about that when zero tolerance finally came about. And so you know, she is the highest ranking law enforcement official to have signed off on this policy. There's no way around it. Um, but it's also important for us to understand that she didn't have good information. Um, she didn't have clear information. And that speaks to a breakdown in our government systems that exist, you know, and these are vulnerabilities that remain today, which is why I wanted to really explain exactly how these things are supposed to work and show what the consequences can be when they don't. But do you think these vulnerabilities were unique to the Trump administration and his style of governance? Or do you think you know, do you, do you think that this could happen in the Biden administration as well? It doesn't seem likely to me, but you tell me what you think. The Biden administration has been unequivocal in saying that they oppose family separations uh, from the president to the Homeland Security secretary and on down. So I don't think we have any indication that uh, in the Biden administration, something like zero tolerance would be re-implemented. Um, the point is simply that, you know, these structures that we have in place, you know, a chain of command through which principals in our government, you know, cabinet secretaries, people with decision making power are supposed to be informed about the issues from people in the bureaucracy that exists like layers below them who know much greater detail than, than they possibly could at their high level. You know, those systems apply to every policy that's introduced by our federal government. And so when they don't work, you have policies that, you know, are not necessarily logistically feasible um, to not even say anything of their, you know, the ethics behind them being put into place. Why was Donald Trump so obsessed with this policy, do you think? Do you think he was just brainwashed by Stephen Miller and there was so much focus on building the wall and keeping the borders secure that he would go to any lengths to, to try to make that happen? My reporting suggests that it comes down to popularity. Um, President Trump understood you know, from his early campaign rallies that talking about immigration and talking about you know, uh, very strict immigration policies was incredibly popular among his base. And so you know, the more he received that feedback, the harder he dug in and the harder he committed to this goal of trying to seal the border and, and seemed to be willing to stop at nothing. Um, to do so. And I say that because other reporters have brought to light that he proposed things like using alligators and moats to stop people from crossing the border and, and you know, even worse forms of violence, you know, shooting people. These are all things that other reporters have brought to light. So he's being advised by someone like Stephen Miller, who my reporting suggests has a more ideological motivation to his focus on immigration. He believes really strongly in it. Um, Donald Trump seemed to care more about just holding on to his power and, and responded to that by doubling down on immigration and on these harsh measures like family separation so that he pushed very hard even after zero tolerance ended to re-implement it. You have done so much important reporting about this issue, Caitlin. And I wonder now, after all is said and done, after this exhaustive um, investigation for this month's Atlantic cover story, have you come up with any solutions to 
the immigration issue in the United States, because I think most people believe we cannot have completely porous borders and there has to be something put in place. Of course, immigration reform has been tried before. And um, as you know, it's failed because of arguments over, um, you know, a path to citizenship. Um, but but now that you have so much information about this, what do you think should be done about the border in a way that's humane and yet also strong enough to deter too many people from crossing it? I think you need comprehensive immigration reform. And, and I've studied our immigration laws going back to the very founding of the United States. So I can tell you, Katie, um, it's never been easy. None of these laws have been put into place without a fight. But the fact is that our immigration laws have not been meaningfully updated in many decades. And they don't respond to the current geopolitical circumstances that are leading people to try to migrate to the United States. Um, at a baseline level, you know, you need to have processes that work for people who, you know, Congress and the electorate deems should be given access to the United States. We need an orderly system that that works. Right now, we have hundreds of thousands of immigration cases that are backlogged. You know, that's very clearly a system that doesn't work. You know, I've done countless stories about people applying for our asylum system and waiting for years for a resolution on their case. It's not functioning. And when Congress doesn't do anything, the executive branch is left to, to move in but they're so limited in what they can do when it comes to immigration policy because they're not constitutionally empowered to legislate. You know, that's Congress. And so what Congress would have to do to really address the situation meaningfully would be to come together and determine who should be given access to the United States and what is a process that actually works that we can implement. You know, short of that, you're going to continue to have to effectively leave this policy making to the Border Patrol. And zero tolerance is the type of, of conclusion that they've come up with. I also had some hope when the Biden administration started focusing on the root causes of these immigration problems with so many people fleeing their countries and understanding sort of the situation in those countries in terms of, you know, life or death situations and how terrifying it was and that they would rather stay in their home countries but couldn't. Uh, because they feared for the their lives and the lives of their children. Um, has there been any kind of progress made to addressing these root causes and economic aid that could go to central, some of these Central America uh, American countries that are so dangerous for people to just live and earn a living and make a life for them, their families? They are. My reporting trips to parts of Mexico and Central America where, where people migrate from have been very dangerous. And I've had to, you know, take go to great lengths just in these short excursions um, to, to stay safe because of the circumstances that people are leaving behind. Early in the Biden administration, there was a significant infusion of funds or the announcement of a significant infusion of funds toward Central America, in particular, the Northern Triangle countries. Um, and uh, we should mention those countries, Guatemala. Uh, yes, Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador right. um, are where the majority of, of migrants in recent years have come to the United States from. That, that's changed a little bit post-pandemic. But if you're looking at the last few years, that, that's generally true. The problem is that we haven't heard much of a substantive update from the Biden administration on those root causes, and they take time to actually have an impact on the administration is very busy. We have a lot going on. And I think another part of the intractability of the issue here is that we tend to feel like our country is confronting so many issues domestically that, you know, the first thing to sort of fall off of the list when, when you get overwhelmed is, you know, other people over there, you know, across the border. Um, the fact is that I, I believe the statistic is one in four American children have a parent who was born outside the United States. You know, we have thousands of children who are impacted by this one policy, zero tolerance, millions more when you take into account, you know, whether their families are undocumented, whether they have DACA, whether they're caught in the limbo of trying to get access to asylum and can't get a resolution for many years. You know, this is a domestic issue as much as it's a foreign policy issue and one that really has to be taken seriously and that takes a lot of work to make change on. 
And if change doesn't happen, it becomes a political hot potato. And unfortunately, you know, I think immigrants become the target of all kinds of of racism and hatred, especially as demographics in this country change so dramatically with, I guess, 2044, there's going to be a majority minority population. And I think all of that makes for the ingredients of someone like Donald Trump coming into the picture and and really exploiting this issue for political gain. That's right. A lot of times when people like Donald Trump are, are talking about immigration, what they're really talking about is race. You know, it, it's a proxy uh, and a way to invoke a sort of fear about white replacement um, and about you know, surging minorities in the United States without saying so explicitly. I think it's up to reporters, frankly, to point that out more. Um, and again, up to Congress to see that happening, um, which is nothing new. As I said, I've, I've gone back and looked all the way to the 19th century and, and that race as a, as a proxy, it's always been part of the national immigration debate and ignoring it really doesn't help. Um, this is a conversation that needs more facts, not less, and sort of more clarity of, of speaking um, rather than less. And so, you know, we do, I think, probably need to confront that directly in order to make meaningful progress. Well, your reporting is certainly a start and you're making inroads in that conversation. Caitlin Dickerson, thank you so much and congratulations on, on your fine work. And everyone can read Caitlin's cover story in this month's Atlantic Magazine. Thank you again, Caitlin. Thank you, Katie.